Echolocation is a true biological superpower. The ability to emit sound waves and then listen back to the echoes in order to navigate and detect prey is simply incredible, and has enabled certain animal groups to become amazingly successful over the course of their evolution. Not only is echolocation itself an astounding evolutionary development, but the fact that it has appeared in unrelated animal lineages on more than one occasion is also extraordinarily remarkable. Among living animals, bats and toothed whales are well known to have the ability to echolocate, but you might not have realised that it's even more widespread than that. Various other mammal groups, as well as some living birds, also have forms of echolocation, and there are some extinct groups that might have echolocated too. So in this video we're going to be taking a look at every time echolocation has convergently evolved in animals. Convergent evolution is a surprisingly common event across many different groups, occurring when unrelated organisms that are adapting to live in a similar environment or perform a similar behaviour end up evolving very similar features. It makes a lot of sense that it happens so frequently, as the features that work best in a given environment or for a given behaviour will be favoured by natural selection, resulting in similar solutions to the same problem across unrelated lineages. People have been really enjoying the videos we've been doing on convergent evolution, so far on turtles and moles, and so I thought echolocation would be another really interesting topic to look at. Again, please do let me know your suggestions for other instances of convergent evolution that you'd like to see us cover. It's very fun making these videos and seeing just how prevalent convergent evolution is in nature. Anyway, let's get to it then. Here's every time that things have evolved echolocation. First of all, we should start with probably the most well-known example of echolocation in animals, the bats. Bats, technically called Chiroptera, actually originated pretty early on in terms of mammalian evolution, with the very oldest bat fossils known from rocks dating to about 52 million years ago, during the early Eocene epoch. It seems that these bats radiated very rapidly at the start of the Eocene, with quite a few different species being found, at the same time as there was a global temperature rise and also a plant and insect radiation, presumably providing more food sources for these remarkable mammals. The rather odd thing about the bat fossil record though, is that these first bat species already look, well, like bats. We don't currently know exactly what the bat ancestor was like before they evolved the ability of powered flight, since the earliest bat species, Icaronike teres gunnelli, named in April of 2023, clearly already had the very long arm and finger bones for supporting wing membranes. It does make sense when you consider the nature of the fossil record and bat skeletons, however. These animals generally have very small, delicate bones that don't exactly have a high preservation potential, being much more likely to end up destroyed before they get fossilised and it's only in very specific, exceptional circumstances that their skeletons are preserved, such as in the incredible Green River Formation of Wyoming, where these earliest Eocene species are found, or in the slightly younger Messel Formation of Germany. Since bats are already so bat-like right at the start of the Eocene Epoch then, it can be safely assumed that they originated at some point in the older Paleocene Epoch, which means that they must have first appeared only a few million years after the famous extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period that wiped out all non-avian dinosaurs, which is pretty amazing to think about. But anyway, how and when did echolocation evolve in the bat lineage? That's been the subject of some debate among researchers, and some very recent fossil discoveries have been made that add to this discussion. In October of 2023, a new bat species was described from 50 million year old cave deposits in France, based on the remains of at least 23 individuals all fossilised together. Not only does this show that bats were likely roosting in caves by this time, but among the fossils there was an incredibly well-preserved, uncrushed bat skull, which allowed the paleontologists to see that this ancient species was already capable of laryngeal echolocation. Now, it's important here that we define what exactly is meant by laryngeal echolocation, because as we'll see, Bats actually have a few different ways of echolocating. The most widespread one among bats is laryngeal, or advanced, echolocation. This is where the ultrasound is produced in the larynx of the animal, and having this ability requires certain features of the inner ear bones that can then be examined in fossil remains to see if an extinct species could use this type of echolocation. Well, thanks to the very well-preserved skull of the 50 million year old French species, named Vialasia, the paleontologists were able to tell that it most likely was indeed using laryngeal echolocation. Not only that, but looking at its evolutionary relationships to living and other extinct bats, they found Vialasia to place as the sister group to the crown group bats, 
meaning it's the closest known extinct relative to the ancestors of all living bat species. This also means that laryngeal echolocation predates the evolution of the crown group bats, and so it must have evolved in older, more basal lineages. Indeed, quite a few other Eocene species of so-called stem bats, meaning the bats that split off before the evolution of the ancestors of all living bats, seem to have been capable of echolocation too. Icaronike terrace, which I mentioned earlier, along with various other species, were most likely echolocating based on the anatomy of their inner ears and the bones at the bases of their skulls, as well as their stomach contents. However, there's another prehistoric bat species from the early Eocene called Onychonike terrace, named in 2008 from fossils also found in the Green River Formation of Wyoming, and this bat was apparently not an echolocator yet. Onychonike terrace had relatively small cochlea, part of the inner ear bones, unlike the larger cochlea of bats that use laryngeal echolocation and use them to detect high-frequency sounds. Not only is this just a very cool prehistoric bat, still possessing claws on the ends of all five of its long fingers and likely using them to climb about in trees, but it also demonstrates that flight evolved in these mammals before echolocation did. This had been a significant debate in the study of bat evolution, with three different hypotheses being supported by different researchers the flight first hypothesis, the echolocation first hypothesis, and the tandem development hypothesis. Well, the discovery of a flying but seemingly not yet echolocating prehistoric bat provides some pretty solid confirmation of the flight first hypothesis, although it should be noted that some researchers have argued that Onychonike terrace actually could echolocate, but then the original describers of the species rebutted and provided more evidence suggesting it was not an echolocator. Anyway, Although Onychonike teres lived slightly later than the oldest known species, Icaronike teres gunnelli, it seems to represent a lineage that branched off from other bats earlier on, as its morphology shows it to be one of the most basal or primitive bats currently known. So the exact timing of when echolocation evolved in bats is still unclear, but presumably it was somewhere between the time that the Onychonike teres lineage split off and the lineage leading to Icaronike teres and other Eocene bats evolved so either the very earliest Eocene, or perhaps even in the older Paleocene. Echolocation evolved as a specialization for prey capture, specifically a foraging strategy called continuous aerial hawking, whereby bats catch their insect prey on the wing, often making fast adjustments to their flight. Echolocation enables these remarkable mammals to orient themselves, track where their prey is moving, and to avoid obstacles, and it's been hypothesized that this was the first method of foraging that evolved in echolocating bats, developing from a hunting technique where they would perch and use their vision and hearing to detect stationary prey and make short flights, before using a combination of these senses along with echolocation to track stationary and moving prey in the air. However, as I mentioned earlier, not all bats use laryngeal echolocation. The order Chiroptera also includes the so-called megabats, the fruit bats and the flying foxes. These bats are grouped together in the family Pteropodidae, and it used to be generally accepted that the bat family tree could be split into these megabats and then all the laryngeal echolocating microbats. However, more recent genetic studies have since shown that things are not quite so simple. The megabats do all still group together in the family Pteropodidae, but it turns out that a lineage of so-called microbats are actually more closely related to them than to other laryngeal echolocating bats. This group of microbats is Rhinolophoidea, which includes the horseshoe bats and their relatives, and together with Pteropodidae, they now make up a group called Yinterochiroptera. The remaining microbat lineages are then grouped together in Yangochiroptera. The realization of this relationship between bat lineages is particularly interesting when you consider that it means there's a group of non-laryngeal echolocating bats essentially sandwiched in between two lineages of bats that do use laryngeal echolocation. And it's here that we come to one of the other great debates of bat evolution. Did laryngeal echolocation evolve once in the ancestors of all living bats, later becoming lost in the pteropodids? Or did it independently evolve both in the Yangochiropterans and in the rhinolophoids? Various studies looking at genes involved in high-frequency hearing and evidence from the embryonic development of the hearing apparatus seem to favour the convergent evolution of laryngeal echolocation at least twice within bats. However, investigations into the development of the cochlea in bat fetuses 
plus the evidence from the fossils showing that it had evolved before the ancestors of all modern bats, would seem to better support the idea that it was secondarily lost in the pteropodids. However, even if laryngeal echolocation in Yango chiropterans and the rhinolophoids is not an instance of convergent evolution, there's still another pretty incredible example of echolocation convergently evolving within bats themselves. Despite not being able to use laryngeal echolocation, there is actually a genus within the pteropodids that has evolved another kind of rudimentary echolocation. Members of the genus Rosettus, including species such as the Egyptian fruit bat, will produce clicks with their tongues and listen back to the echoes in order to detect objects, and have actually been recorded performing amazingly well in obstacle avoidance experiments where they use this form of echolocation. And not only that, but researchers have also found that some other pteropodids also produce clicks with their wings and use this as another form of rudimentary echolocation. At least two species, the cave nectar bat and the lesser short-nosed fruit bat, have been shown to clap their wings together more frequently in the dark, seemingly using the echoes to help navigate when they can't see. And it might be that this sort of basic wing clapping echolocation is more widespread among pteropodids than we'd realised. So then, the evolution of echolocation in bats is one of the most incredible innovations in the history of mammals. And looking at how many species of living bats there are, over 1400 of them, it clearly enabled these animals to become amazingly successful. And it seems, they even managed to evolve forms of echolocation at least three different times, which is just fascinating. But what about the other times that echolocation has convergently evolved among different animal lineages? The other most well-known example of echolocating animals are the toothed whales, technically the odontocetes. All living members of the toothed whale lineage use echolocation in order to detect prey and other objects underwater. And again this incredible use of biosonar has enabled these animals to become remarkably successful and diverse as they can hunt and navigate in low visibility waters. Odontocetes are obviously very different animals from bats, and their echolocation works in a different way too. The whales produce their sounds at a point called the phonic lips, a part of their nasal passages where they become constricted, near to the blowhole. These sounds are then propagated through the acoustic tissues in the melon, the name given to the mass of fat in the foreheads of odontocetes which functions as a sound lens, refracting the sounds in certain directions. When the sound waves are bounced off of objects and return to the cetacean, they pick them up through their lower jaws and they are then transmitted to the inner ear. Toothed whales first appeared about 38 million years ago, and since all living members of the group echolocate and have the same way of producing and receiving the sounds, we can be pretty certain that there was a single evolutionary origin for echolocation in the ancestors of all living odontocetes. However, there's a now extinct lineage of toothed whales that, you may be surprised to learn, actually independently evolved echolocation. Because why not at this point? Convergent evolution really is just out of control. Anyway, these were the Xenorophids, which lived during the Oligocene Epoch about 30 to 23 million years ago, and they are mainly known from fossils found in North and South Carolina. Xenorophids are classed as stem odontocetes, again because they diverged from other odontocetes before the ancestors of all living species evolved. The reason they're considered to have independently evolved echolocation is because it seems that a lineage that's sandwiched between the Xenorophids and the crown group odontocetes apparently did not have the ability to hear ultrasonic sound, based on analysis of a fossil preserving the inner ear of one of these cetaceans. This lineage, which includes species such as Olympocetus found in Washington state, therefore either secondarily lost the ability to echolocate, or never had it in the first place, meaning it evolved twice, in the Xenorophids, and then also in the more derived odontocetes. Paleontologists favour this second interpretation, based on the fact that the skull anatomy of Xenorophids also shows a well-documented convergence on living toothed whales, with trends such as cranial telescoping, whereby certain bones in the skull elongate and others shorten while becoming increasingly overlapped, evolving in parallel in both the Xenorophids and later odontocetes. So that's a pretty remarkable other case of convergent evolution of this amazing ability between related groups. But it gets even better, because even amongst the crown group odontocetes, certain specific types of echolocation have convergently evolved on multiple occasions. Most living toothed whales produce what are called broadband biosonar clicks, which range in different species from frequencies of tens of kilohertz up to between 150 and 170 kilohertz. Keep in mind that the human hearing range is about 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. 
However, a few species across various toothed whale families have evolved what is known as narrowband high frequency biosonar. These whales produce clicks that have peak frequencies of 125 to 140 kilohertz and have a much narrower bandwidth in which they produce them, about 11 to 20 kilohertz. This is another example of convergent evolution on a specific type of echolocation, as 13 species within four different toothed whale families are known to use this, namely members of the porpoise family, the La Plata river dolphin, the dwarf and pygmy sperm whales, and species of oceanic dolphins. Interestingly, they all seem to have something else in common. They're all relatively small. The idea is then that these smaller toothed whales, which are at risk of predation from larger predators, particularly orcas in our modern oceans, had selection pressures acting on them that drove their biosonar signals above 100 kilohertz. Since killer whales have poor hearing above this level, generally using much lower frequencies. Therefore, the result is a sort of acoustic crypsis, helping these smaller whales avoid detection by large predators that can't hear these higher frequencies as well. However, a study published in 2019 suggests that predation pressure from orcas doesn't explain everything about narrowband high-frequency biosonar. Looking at cochlear anatomy in living and extinct odontocetes, as well as molecular data, these researchers found that narrowband high-frequency biosonar adaptations in three out of the four lineages first appeared at least 10 million years ago, and possibly up to 18 million years ago, long before killer whales evolved. There were, however, other kinds of whale killers lurking in the oceans back then, namely the macroraptorial sperm whales, species such as the infamous leviathan, as well as a variety of others. Similarities in the cochlear anatomy between some of these ancient sperm whales and modern orcas suggest that they were also not very sensitive to frequencies above 100 kHz, and so predation pressure by these terrifying predatory sperm whales could have been one of the initial drivers of smaller-bodied whales raising their biosonar frequencies. Then, the later appearance of the orca lineage was likely responsible for the most recent instance of independent evolution of narrowband high-frequency biosonar in the oceanic dolphins. So, it's pretty remarkable that echolocation seems to have evolved not just once, but twice within cetaceans, showing again how beneficial this ability is to the success of different animal lineages. The convergence of specific favoured frequencies also demonstrates the versatility of echolocation, as well as providing some fascinating insight into how predation pressure can influence its use. Bats and toothed whales are not the only mammals that can echolocate, however. You may be surprised to learn that there are several other groups of distantly related mammals that have also evolved this remarkable ability. One of these other instances can be seen in the Tenrex. Tenrex themselves are also a wonderful example of convergent evolution with hedgehogs, with some species looking incredibly similar to these little mammals, and other species of Tenrex look a lot like shrews or rodents. However, they actually belong to a completely different lineage of mammals, the Afrotherians, and are only found in Madagascar, having descended from ancestors that must have rafted over to the island from mainland Africa many millions of years ago. Incredibly, it seems that these amazing little mammals have also converged upon a form of echolocation, with experiments performed by researchers in the 60s finding that they were able to navigate in the dark, apparently by emitting clicks with their tongues and listening back to the echoes. Specifically, the Lesser Hedgehog Tenrec, the Lowland Streaked Tenrec, and Dobson's Shrew Tenrec were all found to emit clicking noises when exploring new locations. It was also noted that some Tenrecs have what was termed a stridulating organ down their backs, comprising rows of specialised quills that rub against each other to produce sounds. Although it was hypothesized that this stridulating organ may also be related to the echolocating abilities of the Tenrex, it might actually be that they are just used for communication between individuals, and not in helping to navigate. So, Tenrex are even more awesome than you might have realized. Some species of shrews are also known to be able to echolocate. Experiments done in the 60s and 70s showed that short-tailed shrews, as well as members of the genus Sorex, used ultrasonic pulses in order to explore their environments, and could even use echolocation to identify an open versus a closed tube through which they could travel. Studies have also shown that the highly vocal nature of shrews may be explained by the fact that a lot of species likely use high-pitched laryngeal twittering calls in order to investigate their habitat, as the rate of their calls changes depending on the density of their surroundings. This simple form of echolocating therefore enables these mammals to investigate what's close around them, extending their sensory range beyond the limit of their whiskers and other tactile hairs. 
Since shrews are members of Eulipatifla, they are not close relatives of Tenrax, and so this is yet another instance of echolocation convergently evolving in mammals. Other mammal lineages within Eulipatifla have also independently evolved echolocation as well though. One of these other groups are the Solenodons, little insectivorous burrowing mammals with venomous saliva. Just two species of Solenodon are alive today, one of which lives on Cuba and the other on Hispaniola in the Caribbean. The Hispaniolan Selenodon has been documented making sharp, high-pitched clicks when exploring a new area or encountering an unfamiliar animal, and is noted to be similar to the basic echolocation of shrews. These clicks tend to have frequencies of between 9 to 31 kHz, and considering the reduced eyes of Selenodons, this form of echolocation is likely used to help these mammals make their way about their habitat. Another lineage of Eulipatiflans that have been suggested by the odd researcher to echolocate are the hedgehogs, because it turns out there are actually some ultrasonic hedgehogs. Sonic hedgehogs. I'm serious. Some hedgehogs actually seem to be able to detect ultrasounds, apparently up to 84 kilohertz, as they'll clearly respond to sounds at these frequencies. They will also produce ultrasonic clicks or whistles, however it's not clear if they're actually properly echolocating, and it hasn't been demonstrated for certain. Still, it is very interesting. Elsewhere on the great family tree of mammals, echolocation has also arisen within rodents. Specifically, members of the soft-furred tree mouse genus Tiflomus have been confirmed to emit ultrasonic vocalizations that peak at around 98 kHz, based on experiments done on these animals. Amazingly, in addition to experimentally demonstrating that the soft-furred tree mice can echolocate, the researchers also found that the inner ear bones had convergently evolved features with the ear bones of bats specifically a fusion of the stylohyal bone with the tympanic bone. They also looked at echolocation-related genes that had convergently evolved in bats and these mice, providing even more evidence that the rodents can echolocate. These mice were only officially proven to echolocate in 2021, showing that this ability may actually be even more widespread among mammals than we'd realised, and there may yet be other lineages capable of this that we haven't found yet. In fact, it also appears to be present among primates too, specifically in the eye eye and even in humans. Eye eyes, a highly specialized nocturnal lemur species that only lives on the island of Madagascar, have incredibly long, thin, flexible middle fingers on their hands with which they rapidly tap along the bark of trees. Using their incredibly sensitive ears to listen to the reverberations within, they can actually detect where the mines of wood-boring insect larvae are, which is pretty incredible. Oh, and they also use those long middle fingers to pick their noses and feed on their own mucus. I'm not joking, there's literally a peer-reviewed published paper all about it. There's even a scientific name for nose picking, rhinotilexis. I love science so much. Anyway, that could be a whole other video by itself. Let me know if you actually want that. There have been some investigations into the exact evolutionary origins of this sort of eye-eye echolocation, with researchers looking at whether there were convergences between the auditory processing genes of eye-eyes and echolocating bats and whales. As it turns out, there isn't any significant convergence between them, meaning that the auditory adaptations of eye-eye tap foraging are an example of a completely distinct innovation. However, the researchers stress that this doesn't necessarily mean that what the eye-eye does is not echolocation, since they are still listening back to the echoes of a sound they produce themselves in order to find prey. It just evolved in a very different way. There are also a lot of remarkable instances of humans with sight loss being able to learn how to echolocate by actively creating sounds, often clicking their tongues or by tapping a cane on the floor, and then listening back to the echoes in order to perceive the positioning, distance, size, shape, and even the material of different objects. It also turns out that sighted individuals can learn to echolocate like this as well, but on average, blind people are better at it. Documented examples include people with sight loss who are able to use the echoes from tongue clicks in order to navigate cities, when hiking, playing sports, and even avoiding obstacles when riding bikes. Obviously human echolocation doesn't involve ultrasound as much as other echolocating mammals, as the sounds must be within the range of human hearing. It seems that areas of the brain associated with visual processing, namely the visual cortex, are involved in interpreting the spatial information gathered through echolocation. Since these areas of the brain are thought to be recruited for auditory processing in blind people, this could also explain why people without sight tend to be better at echolocating too, as there's an increase in cortical resources that can process auditory information. 
So, echolocation is apparently something that can be utilized in many different mammal lineages, though not to the same extent as the highly specialized bats and toothed whales. It's a fascinating phenomenon that has understandably been the subject of a great deal of study when it occurs in people, and shows how remarkably adaptable humans can be. Once again, it also opens up the possibility that various forms of echolocation may be present in many different mammal lineages, even if we haven't identified them yet. For example, pink fairy armadillos are another kind of mammal I've seen being hypothesized to utilize echolocation, which would be very interesting to investigate further. But mammals are not the only animals that are capable of echolocation. It's also convergently evolved a few times within birds. The birds we're talking about here are several species within the swift family, plus the oil bird, a nocturnal cave-dwelling species found in South America that's related to frogmouths and potus. The echolocation used by these birds is generally of lower resolution than that of most bats and toothed whales, and they produce signals that are actually within the range of human hearing. The birds make these sounds in the syrinx, their vocal organs, emitting broadband clicks that allow them to navigate in caves. It doesn't seem like most of these birds are using echolocation to detect prey, as the lower frequencies they emit aren't suited for picking up very small objects, so instead it's probably mostly used for navigating in the dark. Still, some researchers have reported observing a couple of swiftlet species echolocating outside of the caves where they nest, apparently while hunting small insects. So they suggest perhaps it is better developed in some species compared to others. Not only did echolocation convergently evolve in the oil bird lineage as well as in members of the swift family, but within the swift family, it also seems to have arisen on at least two different occasions. 16 different species within the swiftlet subgroup have been confirmed as echolocators, including most species of the genus Aerodramus, as well as the pygmy swiftlet, the species Colocalia troglodytes. Looking at the evolutionary relationships of these bird species to each other, it turns out that between the echolocating Aerodramus species and the pygmy swiftlet are several swiftlet species that do not echolocate, once again implying that either echolocation evolved once in the ancestors of all living swiftlets and was lost in these certain lineages, or that it independently evolved twice. This second interpretation seems to have the most supporting evidence, based on analysis of units of the echolocation system in these birds, showing that independent evolution on two occasions is more likely than the loss of this ability in specific groups. So, as you can see, convergent evolution is once again just out of control, and it truly never fails to blow my mind thinking about how many times such an incredible capability has evolved not just in unrelated groups of animals, but also among very closely related groups too. So that pretty much covers every living example of echolocation among animals. But what about more examples of extinct animals that might have echolocated? Well, there's a kind of small prehistoric mammal that lived during the Eocene Epoch, over 45 million years ago, called Hyopsidus, and it may also have been an echolocator. Hyopsidus is potentially a member of the mammal group Perissodactyla, which today includes horses, rhinos, and tapirs, or it's at least a close relative of the lineage. And I love the nickname that's been given to this animal, the tube sheep. Very descriptive. There's a complete skull of the species Hyopsidus lepidus that's housed in the American Museum of Natural History, and paleontologists have been able to CT scan this fossil to create a digital endocast of its brain. Studying the anatomy of the tube sheep's brain, it was observed that a part of the midbrain involved in processing auditory information, called the inferior colliculus, was particularly well developed. In conjunction with the overall anatomy of this Hyopsidus species, which seems to have been a burrowing animal, the paleontologists therefore propose that it may have been utilizing a simple form of echolocation to navigate, similar to tenrecs and shrews. A later study also examined the cochlea of Hyopsidus based on the same digital scan data, finding that it would not have had sophisticated echolocation like that of modern bats. However, it could probably have detected frequencies up to almost 77 kHz, a compatible hearing range for terrestrial echolocation. The study explains that the inner ear anatomy of Hyopsidus cannot be used alone to either support or reject the echolocating hypothesis and so it seems that more research is needed to confirm whether the tube sheep really did have this ability. I also wanted to briefly mention that some incredible echolocation defenses have also evolved among various insects, most notably in different kinds of moths that face predation pressure from bats. There are species of tiger moths that will actually produce ultrasonic clicks themselves when they detect the sonar of an approaching bat, and they are known to startle bats that aren't used to hearing ultrasound from a moth, 
as well as sometimes being used to warn bats that they are toxic and shouldn't be eaten. There are also some moths that use ultrasounds to indicate to bats that they're toxic, even when they're not. Similar to how some harmless species mimic the colorations of toxic species as it increases their chances of survival. A concept known as Batesian mimicry. Incredibly, at least some tiger moths have also been shown to use their ultrasonic clicks in order to actually jam bat sonar. They do this by using their sound-producing organ to make high-duty cycle clicks that act to disrupt the bat's ability to work out the distance to the target, as well as creating fake echoes from objects that aren't really there. This has been shown to be an incredibly effective defense mechanism, with moths that jam sonar being 10 times less likely to be captured by bats than moths that do not. Other types of moths, namely the silk moths, also have a way to defend against echolocation, possessing long trailing hind wings that not only divert bat attacks to these structures and away from the main body, but also create a sensory illusion by rotating during flight, reflecting sonar and creating confusing echoes. Many moths will also engage in evasive maneuvers upon detecting bat ultrasound, going into complex flight patterns in order to try and escape capture. So, the evolution of echolocation in bats has clearly created an intense selection pressure for many species of moths, driving the evolution of some truly incredible defences. Well, there we have it, every time that things have evolved echolocation, at least that we know of so far. It's truly amazing that this ability has repeatedly evolved quite so many times, but considering how useful it is for hunting and navigation, it makes sense that so many different lineages would take advantage of it. I really hope you've enjoyed learning about every case of convergent echolocation evolution, and again, please do let me know your suggestions for what other instances of convergent evolution you'd like to see me cover in future. Thank you so much for watching, and a massive thank you to our channel members. Please do be sure to become a member today if you would like access to some extra behind the scenes content, plus more features that are coming soon. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video and I hope you learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.